the Knights of Malta Volunteers feature in a new book by Jude, a novel based on historical fact. It will introduce a whole new audience to the brave volunteers, medical workers who undoubtedly saved lives by their actions in the city and other troubled places. It will remind everyone who reads the book of the vital role they played. On behalf of my family and the families of the others murdered and wounded on Bloody Sunday, I would just like to say a heartfelt thank you. say a few words on behalf of the Order of Malta Volunteers, uh, someone who has supported me from the very start and who I'm now proud even to call a friend and that's Charlie Glenn. I'm getting behind the podium here because <laughs> I'm very old and I need the support. I'm actually here, first of all, by invitation from Jude. I'm very, very grateful for the invitation. And I've also been delegated by the headquarters of the Ambulance Corps to represent them today. Uh, the reason that they wanted to be represented was that uh, there's never been a history, although we are absorbed in the, on the general history of, of what happened during what we call the Troubles, uh, there has never been a, a, a history as such. and. Um, this is probably going to be the closest thing we have to one. I do know that uh, the late Jim McDade, who some of you may remember from Poor Terrace, uh, compiled, worked hard at compiling records with the intention of doing something. He never got to do it. He never got to do it. Anyway, as I said, this is probably the closest thing to a history that we have, and it's very important that you did it with the sensitivity and attention to detail that he did, and I commend him for it. Do you want to say to you, do you like the uniform? Because if I was doing, if I was doing a history of the world of Malta, you'd heard of a, the history of the world and a hundred objects, I would call it uh, the history of the world of Malta, uh, a history of the world of Malta, and a dozen uniforms, and a subtitle of the good, the bad, and the ugly. <laughs> so I got this in the past couple of weeks, and I think it's pretty good. Uh, so if anybody feels like joining up, this is a uniform you get in the room. But I think that's quite enough from me uh, before I launch into some sort of recruitment drive. But uh, as I say, I'm very, very grateful to Jude for the invitation. We are grateful as an organisation for, for, for him drawing attention to, to what we did in the past. And, uh, I hope you I hope you find the evening very worthwhile. Thank you, Jude. I suppose I, I should start by giving a, a bit of a, an introduction uh, to myself and kind of where the the ghost of riots past came from. Um, I'm an autistic author, and my last two books were kind of my experiences of growing up as an autistic child in the mainstream school system. And the second one's more about my experiences, you know, of kind of in business and stuff like that. So, I mean, last year I was 31, so I kind of ran out of life to write about. Uh, so I needed to kind of think of something a bit different. I needed to, I'd always wanted to write a novel of some shape or form, but I didn't know what that shape or form was. And it was about this time last year where all of the kind of, the, the promotion and kind of advertising and discussion about the Bloody Sunday 50th anniversary program uh, was becoming kind of more mainstream in news and stuff in the town. And you know what? I didn't know anything about it. Nothing. Not a thing. I was born in 1990. Don't let the grey hairs and the beard fool you. <laughs> Don't let it fool you. Honestly, I was, I was born in 1990. My parents were born in 65 and 67. So I suppose especially Bloody Sunday is not something that was something that myself or family were personally affected by. It wasn't really a discussion point, so to speak. So I thought, you know what, I want to educate myself. I want to learn a bit more about it. And whenever I was looking through all of the, like, you know, the pictures and stuff like that, picture books, I thought, you know, there's people in, like, really fancy uniforms and stuff. I was like, you know, who, who are they? 
you know, these fancy kind of officery type uniforms. And I thought, that's really interesting. You know, who are they? And then I found out they were the, the Order of Malta Ambulance Corps, are known to everybody as the Knights of Malta. And I've done volunteer stuff, I've done youth and voluntary work for years. And just to kind of draw attention to the photograph on the top right, is that's Alice Long, and that's a Bloody Sunday photograph, and that's that, that's that shirt there, that's that uniform here. And they were everywhere. Where, see, even now, if I say, you look back through picture books of the Battle of the Bogside and, you know, our recent history, is now you'll not, not see them. Where I thought, surely one of them will have written a book or something. Or somebody would have wrote a book about them. Nothing. There was nothing. So I suppose that's where the idea of uh, the, the book was born, in and of itself. And I thought, this is really, really interesting. And one thing I have to say, just while the photograph's there, is I know Charlie you made mention to the late, great Jim McDade, and here he is in the bottom left-hand corner. And over time, I'd met with the first aid group at the time, and everybody was unanimous in saying, Jim would have loved this. Jim no longer with us. Uh, he would have loved tonight. It was a big part of his life. And I think uh, I wanted to give him that uh, a bit of a nod. But then I learned more and more, and I was, I was flicking through things, and I thought, God, they were everywhere. Like the 69 riots, Bloody Sunday, Motorman, like, they were everywhere, and were mostly teenage girls and boys. You know, going out kind of in really dreadful circumstances to render aid to people who were wounded and, and everything else. So I thought, this is an incredible story that has to be told somehow. So I kind of took on the mantle myself to give a go of telling it. So I had like an, an idea, like a, like a nostalgic view of the Free Dairy period, 69 to 72, and I was thinking, what other things are really, really nostalgic, right? Where one thing, and I see them all the time in picture books, is you know, the Rostall Street flats, and I'm from a generation where I can't imagine three giant sector concrete tower blocks of flats in the middle of the bog. I just can't. I can't visualise it. But then there's other people who will say, God, I still... Get, Whenever I think of the bog, the things are still there. So I thought the high flats were, there's Facebook groups dedicated to residents of the high flats, and I thought I'll get lots of stories and stuff like that. And as I looked more on the kind of Bloody Sunday and stuff, I was thinking, oh, Hugh Gilmore left there. Could this be an opportunity to tell his story as well and cite it? And even other places as well, the Melville Hotel, the Irish Kitchen, where I just, I suppose I kind of wanted to kind of write a bit of a, a, a love letter to Derry of the past and you know that time period, but have it you know from the perspective of, of the Order of Malta. And a really rich and inspiring history. It was led by this incredible man here, Captain Leo Day. Um, just somebody that the whole group just adored. A wonderful man. He was the principal of uh, the Waterside Boys School, uh, now Chapel Road Primary School uh, in time. And I got looking through like photographs, pictures and stuff. And I came up with this as a, this is a newspaper clipping from uh, the first aid kind of training cohort that started on the 7th of October 1968. And with the, the, the first aid group from Bloody Sunday, that's when most of them started, where it would be that day where they started. And I, and I got really, I got, I dived on there really deep and I, w I wanted to look at like pictures, videos especially, because as a, I did have challenges, right? Especially when writing a novel, I thought, okay, most of the Order of Malta were, were teenage girls, and I was never a teenage girl. I don't know old money. I don't have any first aid training, and I didn't have what people would call the turn of phrase, because language evolves all the time. So I went looking for like videos, uh, and even film of Derry from way back when. And it came up with this, and it's a gem, and I hope it plays. I really, really hope it plays. And it's a song by the late Eamon Free, the late great Eamon Free. And it's taken from a film called The Best Man, uh, which was released in the early 80s. But I thought, you know what, I'm going to listen to it and watch it. And I was just so moved by it, where I thought, if I can capture the kind of atmosphere and spirit of a song into a book, then I think it would be all worthwhile. So fingers crossed it plays. Watching days go by, you get the notion in your head. You're going nowhere. I'm sure you felt that way too. 
Don't the good times fly? They say you'll be a long time dead. If life's for living, it's up to you. Let's dance. Romance. Find El Dorado. Beyond the mountains of the moon. No fears. No tears. You pay the piper. You call the tune. Watching days go by, you get the notion in your head. You're going nowhere. I'm sure you felt that way too. Don't the good times fly? They say you'll be a long time dead. If life's for living. It's up to you. Let's dance. Romance. Find El Dorado. Beyond the mountains of the moon. No fears. No tears. You pay the piper. You call the tune. It's just such a beautiful song. It's a hidden gem, and I was, I was just completely moved by it. And I thought, I have to, do, I have to do, you know, something. I have to incorporate that some way, and I did. Which is, you know, the book's bro broken up into five parts, and the lyrics to that song are parts one, two, and three. Where I thought, you know, Eamon Free was a, you know, a huge contributor to local kind of culture and music and heritage, and I thought, fantastic. I've got an atmosphere of, you know, what I wanted to write about and how I wanted to achieve it. So I kind of got like a basic storyline. So I thought, right, I'm going to have to meet up. I, I, I wanted to meet up with. Uh, for example, the family and relatives of, and friends of Hugh Gilmore and the Order of Malta volunteers from that time. And I mean, even going to the, the Order of Malta volunteers, I knew it was going to be kind of like a difficult task at the start. Because at the start to everybody, I'm just another nosy journalist. I'm just another somebody that's going to ask difficult questions and all of that. And as, as time went on, you know, more and more people kind of got involved in it and, and started to enjoy it and everything. And re reconnecting, you know, with, with old friends, which is a really, really lovely thing. And we kind of met, like, as, as a group and individually and everything o over the course of the last six, seven months. And, you know, huge thanks to the Museum of Free Dairy for making initial connections. And then people inside the group connecting with other people, kind of vouching for me. You know what? He's all right. He's a bit subtle. And you know, the first uh, kind of meeting with the, the Order of Malta volunteers, do you know what it was like? It was like having a first date with 15 people. <laughs> <laughs> Convinced that I wasn't going to ask difficult questions. Like, you know, because of course, when involved in such pivotal days in history, you expect certain questions. You don't expect questions like, what was Osmond House like? What shoulder did you wear your bags on? What did you wear in your feet? You know, and stuff like that. People don't expect those sorts of questions. Um, it was very much the same in kind of compiling the, the biography of Hugh Gilmore as well. The Flats is this magical place, and that's how I met my kind of partner in crime, Catherine, uh, kind of going through the writing of the book, given through the uh, stories of the Flats and everything as that, and was a, a close friend of the, the Gilmore family, and still is. And it just went on, and everything was just, you know, falling together really, really nicely. And kind of getting over to Hugh, where I thought, right, I'll need to get like photographs and stuff like that. And I said, right, 
you know, is there any photographs, you know, asking you all among the family, are there any photographs and stuff? And the amount of photographs I got was three. That was, that was all there was. This one and then a, a couple of other ones. You know, there's very, very few photographs and I thought, surely there's more photographs than three. So I thought, I'm going to be clever, I'm going to phone St. Patrick's Primary School, where he went to school. He will have a First Communion photograph and he will have a Confirmation photograph. And I will be the boy and I will have found these new photographs. But whenever I got the photographs, it wasn't in them. I was like, how can you not be in your own First Communion photograph? How can you not be in it? Or your Confirmation photograph? Didn't have a, a love of the camera. And I really, really tried to find photographs, scour in Facebook magazines and stuff like that. And, you know, one of the photographs in the collection, I'm going to put up next. But another thing was, I was sitting watching a documentary, it was made by Vonnie Cunningham back in the, you know, the mid-2000s, and it was on the Battle of the Bauxite. And on the left is a photograph, you know, from the family collection. And then, in this documentary, this wee boy showed up and moving footage, and I thought, that wee boy is wild familiar looking. I know the colour of that jumper. And I looked at the photograph, and surely it's him. Passed it around all the friend group and stuff like that, and Jesus, there he is, it's him. Uh, so he, he, he appeared and, and footage, and I thought, oh, that's nice. But it just kept happening. Where I'm not really into spirituality or anything like that, but you know, as time went on, whenever people heard about what I was doing, another photograph of him came up in the tire yard. Here, that there is just there, you know, third over from the left. Because people got talking and said, Oh, I have a photograph and stuff. And on the roof of the flats again, because you, you see that famous image of the, the, the tricolor being hoisted onto the roof of the flats. And if you move the, the full, full frame of the image, there it is standing on it. So he is there. And this one's very, very faint. It's very, very hard to see. Um, where I'd learned, you know, Hugh was, you know, training to be a mechanic, was a tire fitter, and he'd got a wee car, a wee runabout that one of these muckers used to mess about in. And I was looking at photographs of the, you know, the courtyard, the flats, and I thought, God, there's a lopsided wee car sitting there. You know, who would have a lopsided car sitting on a car park? And again, passed it round, everybody in the wee car turned up. So things just kept happening and turning up, which I thought, which I couldn't really explain. Uh, even... Uh, Actually, after giving all of these photographs, right, I came out of Olive's house and had two punctures in a brand new car. <laughs> I thought, oh, come on, come on, like, and it was, it was just, it was, it was a really, really strange thing. I can't explain it, and I've got to the point where I don't even want to try anymore. But the photographs did turn up, and what's interesting, and especially compiling the biography of you, Gilmore, among all the friend group, and I'm seeing a couple of people and a couple of faces. The main emotion was laughter, which, you know, fond memory, you know, a child, you know, they were all out having about a crack, messing about in this week here, not a driving license between them, you know, and, you know, just to kind of recall on his kindness, how well he looked after his friends and his mother and his sisters and brothers and everybody else. But I was just kind of getting to compile this, because for me, it's hard to quantify a tragedy. Especially that of the murder of a child, of a 17-year-old boy, 17 and a few months. And about five or six weeks ago, I got it, right? Because, uh, like, I've been meeting and talking to the, the Order of Malta volunteers for months and months and months. And see, with, with the notes that I'd taken and stuff like that, and the drawings and everything that I made, don't ask. Where I had got, you know, notebooks, and they were, there were 17 of them, right? And they were completely full. With compiling Hugh Gilmore's biography, it was half of one. And that was it. Half of one, where it's only 17 years and six months. Where some people with the Order of Malta have been at 45, 50 years plus, and there's many, many experiences and stuff like that that were able to be compiled. So I, I suppose it gave me like a visual kind of understanding of the gravity of the, the tragedy and Initially, with the, with the first aid group, I didn't really want to talk about the difficult days. I thought, everything's out there, right? The likes of Savile and stuff like that, statements were already given, and I never had any intention of asking anybody about them, at least, like, initially. But as time went on, there was a realisation among the group that they'd never talked about it, to their, some in cases to their families, with each other, 
or, or anything and it was kind of like a, an accidental nice byproduct of the book is that there's been some kind of instances of kind of healing and closure as well which is something I didn't plan for or intend or anything but uh, it happened and you know kind of leading on to the you know the the, the 69 riots the, the the battle of the bauxite where Whenever I had heard about the Order of Malta rule, now, the, the main first aid post for those three days, it's actually still standing. It's framed to perfection, picture framers at the bottom of the new road. And it's still there. And in there, for three days, you know, you had teenage girls splitting fractures, treating petrol bomb burns, and even as far as suturing people, stitching people up with household needles and thread for three days. And it's called by history a first aid post. But even to call it a first aid post is almost a battle of an insult, a full battlefield hospital. That's pretty much what it was, and there were three of them. There was one at the bottom of the of Westland Street as well. And even in pictures, they're all the way through. And with one of the group, it was a, a, a great story. Uh, Dr. Donald McDermott, who was the, uh, the chief medical officer of the Order of Malta, said to one of the wee girls, uh, can, you, can you stitch this man up, please, because you can? And she says, I can't. I can't stitch anybody. And he says, can you sew? And she says, I can. And he says, well, you can stitch quick as you can, please, away you go. And she, and she applied the same process. She was taught that day, on the second day of the riots, all the way through her 45-year nursing career, punch, pierce, pull. <laughs> and that was it, and it, it, it served her well. And I mean, you know, three days, I mean, a battle, you know, kind of triumphant, kind of from certain points of view, but really what it was, was a humanitarian crisis where all law and all order completely and utterly broke down and was propped up by a team of teenage girls and boys and their leader, Mr. Day. That's what happened, and even to say it, because I'd had access to some papers and documents that were written by Mr. Day, a great record keeper, a man after my own heart. Uh, if anybody's a black belt in keeping records, it's me. Uh, so we, I really, really kind of identified with him in that way. Because he says there, even on this report, in the circumstances, treatment beyond the accepted limits of first aid had to be given. And it was given, and they held the posts for three days. Uh, but nobody talks about it, where everybody's just, you know, even on the first aid group, I was like, you were stitching people up with needles and thread. Oh, I, I, I. And it was no big deal. It was no big issue. It was just, that's what we did. That was our role. And we just did it. And... That was just that, where even as time went on as well, kind of from talking about the riots, where, you know, Bloody Sunday eventually did come into the conversation. And even hearing about, you know, how some of them were, were treated. And I thought, you know, for, for tonight, I wanted to show now, of course, you know, the, the heroic actions of the whole unit are there in black and white to see. I've made a point of, of noting them all down in the book. But th this was something that I really wanted to, to, to show people, where this is, a, this is a bloody Sunday photograph here. And on the photograph on the left, you've got Maureen Gallagher on the left in the grey dress. You've got Rosemary Doyle there in the white coat. And Robert Chapman, oh, among us this evening, uh, in, in the middle. Uh, I mean, the two girls were very young. They were quite frightened. Robert was a married man with kids at the time, so they kind of stuck to him. And around this time, this is when things really, really started to go off. And um, Rosemary there in the white coat, just about a minute after this photograph was taken, uh, one of the paras shot her in the face with a rubber button round, which broke her jaw and uh, dislodged some of her teeth. But yet, about five minutes later, here she is again in Glenfada Park, helping somebody, assisting a lady who was injured. But nobody has ever kind of really kind of discussed that involvement ever, and it's all it's always been kind of left. And I mean, there, there's full, I mean, the book's full of stories like this. But if, you know, for teenage girls to do this, and boys, you know, to go out on the line of fire, they read the raid to people who were wounded, and you know, I can't give praise high enough for them. But again, Mr. Day certainly can, and I'm going to read it out from his report. It says, I cannot speak too highly of the work done by the members of the dairy units on Sunday. Many of them are still in their teens. They seldom saw death before, never the awful wounds and mangled dead bodies. I'm told that some give artificial respiration, the kiss of life, and the most forbidding circumstances, and continued until a doctor pronounced death. It was not surprising that a couple were actually sick as a result of their experience, but not one gave in. 
They all continued till the last casualty was got to hospital. And finally, one girl of 20 went with relatives to the morgue to help identify a neighbor. Where to have that, I thought, like whenever I read that for the first time, I thought this is just extremely powerful. And I, I felt definitely a validation as to, to what, I was, what I was doing. And even kind of talking to everybody, like I, I'd asked, where I had kind of two distinct sets of groups. I had the Order of Malta volunteers and I had the Gilmores, where I thought right, I'd wanted to do a, like a dedication for, for one each. And I asked, you know, the first aid group, I said, you know, who did everybody really love? Who did everybody really look up to? And without a doubt, without hesitation, everybody said, Mr. D. Everybody said it. Nobody said anything different. And even among kind of Hugh's friends, I asked them all the same questions. I asked them all the same thing. I said, who did you really love and admire and look up to? And without flinching, everybody said it. Bernard Bonner. Everybody said it. Bernard just loved him. He loved him. We talked about him all the time. And what's really fitting too is I asked, you know, the, the press and the journalists who reviewed the book, I said, were there any scenes that really stuck out? Was there any ones that you really, really liked? And nearly all of them came back with us one, and it's one with, with Hugh and Bernard on it, where, I mean, back then, you know, it's kind of 70, 71, uh, there were football matches out the courtyard at the back of the flats, and I have it in very, very good authority that these football matches were where winners were made and grown men cried. That's how serious people took these matches. And these matches started at nine in the morning, didn't end it really late at night, and the only thing that would stop them was a burst ball or their ma's calling them on for their tea. That was it. And, and one of the scenes, the, the, the main man comes in, you know, to the, to the courtyard of the flats, you know, with his lemonade bottles and everything. And there used to be like a young fella that would have sat in the main lorry with him. And uh, whenever the, the main man lifted the crates and went up to the galleries and whatever, of the higher flat blocks, uh, he runs over to the, the young fella sitting in the lorry and says, Hi, hey, you owe me a fag? <laughs> the, the main man's wee helper says, so she says, I've no fags on me. And then you just thought, says, you know what, can I have a bottle of lemonade instead? <laughs> so, that's, you know, that was, hey, the boy had no fags, he was already full of lemonade, like it was a no-brainer. And he gave him the, the, bo the bottle of lemonade, and all the boys shared the lemonade round. But then at the end, you says, go and give me that bottle back. And he went round to Molly Bars at the bottom of block two. He went down and says, Molly, do you want to buy this bottle of thing? And she went to give him the tuppence or whatever, but she paid for bottles. And you says, no thanks Molly, can I have a single fag instead? <laughs> <laughs> so what he ended up with was the lemonade bottle and the fag. And, and the, the, the like, reviewers were saying, did, did you make that up? I says, no. I says, I heard that story from three different people who were there. And I, I suppose what, what I kind of wanted to capture, especially with, with Hugh's life, is kind of the times they had that friend group and uh, I suppose like a, a real, real time capsule. Uh, that's something I'm really proud of. But what I'd offered the first aiders to do as well was to have like a wee section at the back uh, where if they wanted to contribute something of their own, that they could. And even for, the, for some of the, the volunteers who are sadly no, no longer with us, uh, like Dr. McDermott or Pauline Ferry, and Mr. Day himself, um, even Mrs. McCorkle, who was the, the commandant of the, the British Red Cross, where there's these appendices in the back of real, authentic stories as well. And I have to say, Mrs. McCorkle had some really, really strong foresight, because I've put this in the back, and it says, Good deeds seldom make the headlines. Someday the true story of the first aid volunteers and all the other volunteers who work in the community for the relief of suffering will be told. Where that's exactly what I wanted to do. That's an excerpt from her own uh, memoir, A Red Cross in, in My Pocket. But I suppose that's pretty much everything I have to say. I mean, we've got books there at the back, or eleven ninety nine. There's ones in Little Acorns Bookstore, uh, online on Amazon and stuff like that as well. Where all the way through the journey as well, you know, with the first day, people were giving me their stuff as well. Like their medals, their caps, their uniforms. Uh, various different things, uh, like Alice over here, like Alice's uniform and stuff, which is now uh, part of the permanent free dairy ex uh, ex exhibition, 
But what is in the pipeline for January is an exhibition honouring the Order of Malta with all of their stuff and everything that they have uh, given to me. So I suppose uh, I'm going to take myself down to the, the back now. Please keep in touch. Uh, email me. Uh, social medias and stuff like that are up there. Uh, I'll just leave that slide up there. And once again, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so, so much for coming along. Thank you.